um, us talking about doing a bus route of some kind. We could never get our heads around what it is we were going to do um, until I started connecting with our new DSS commissioner, who I will tell you is the biggest ally that the city of Hudson has had in a long time. Um, we need to be thankful that we have Bob Gibson as the commissioner of DSS. Um, brainstorming with him and a lot of other supervisors, we said, look, let's just start something and build on that. Because often we have a meeting about a meeting and we accomplish nothing. Um, and so we did that and we came up with what we think is a great plan uh, for transportation to and from the college. Now we didn't stop there. So, and I'm going to let the commissioner, I'm not going to get too much details, I'm going to let the commissioner um, release that, but we are working on a second route to employers and shopping centers. Um, and so the commissioner will be announcing that pretty soon. Um, but all of that ties into uh, the housing conversations that we're having. And so we want to talk about economic development and transportation and all that flows together. You, you can't have one without the other. And so we're also talking about the transportation bus line to Albany. We are looking at ways on how to expand that and how to make that more accessible. So all these conversations are taking place at the county level. Um, Supervisor Cross is very instrumental on those. Myself, again, Supervisor Scalera, the chairman. Uh, and so what we're doing there is, you know, we're doing that painstaking work where we aren't always all agreeing. Uh, and I think Lynn Slomaker put it well yesterday when she said, you know, that we have to have some tough conversations and we don't always agree. And sometimes even the tone in which we articulate ourselves isn't proper. But out of that, if we can come to a consensus, comes a good program. And that's what we hope is happening, just like the example of the, of the college group. Um, the second issue I want to talk about is opiate addiction. And to me, this one uh, hits close to home, very passionate, because uh, I'm someone who has done a lot of work with the Promise Neighborhood. And if anybody knows their, their um, prison initiative, um, they deal with a lot of families that are dealing with substance abuse and addictions and things of that nature. I happened to be at a block party. Um, and I was talking to Johnny Hunt, and Judge Connors walked up and said, wow, this is a lovely block party. It's too bad you had someone have an overdose down here. I was like, what are you talking about? And he had mentioned to me that someone had overdosed down in front of the high rise down in the near the Providence Hall area. I was like, wow, well, what are we as the county doing? He says, I have no idea. So I marched up to see the chairman. And I said, well, what are we doing to address opiate situations in, in our city, or in the county for that matter? And he goes, we're giving a ton of money to everybody. I said, well, who's everybody? And are they talking to themselves? Or are they talking to others? Are we coordinating services? Um, and he said, you know what, I don't know. So I started going to all the various services, one by one. What do you do? What do you do? Do you talk to this one? And they all said no. And I said, we can't continue to do business that way. We're all doing something, but together we're doing nothing. And so the chairman said, OK, let's put together a subcommittee with myself as the lead. And then let's come up with a plan. This plan isn't a do all. This plan is to say that we're going to put everybody under the tent, that we're going to work on issues that's pertaining to drug overdose prescription addictions in and around Columbia County. And so we put together our plan. We brought all the people to the table. We've had doctors. We've had the hospital. We've had all the nonprofit organizations in the community sitting at the table. Um, and out of that, we came up with what we thought is a great plan. We found out where the gaps are. We found out where some of the overlap is. And we also found out that the county was actually putting in close to a million dollars a year in all these various agencies doing this work, but we really didn't know what we were putting the money into. We knew we were giving it here, we just didn't know what it was doing. And so some of the gaps that we, we identified, we then partnered with uh, some, some good nonprofits, for example, CPR, and we asked them to develop a phone line for us. And so they came up with a really Create a phone line, which is 1877 Hope 365. All right, brilliant. They develop it, 
We paid for it, and we're now in the midst of paying them so that they can run that phone on that phone line every day, you know, until we, we don't need it anymore. Hopefully that's sometime in the, the very near future, which I don't foresee. But this is something that we, we identified and we took action. Also, we know that we needed a service coordinator, somebody that was going to come in, coordinate all the nonprofit organizations, be an informational hub. We're talking to CPR about that, or whether we're going to have to hire that in-house. But that position is going to come up very soon. So again, this is something else that we're doing. And the big thing that we're doing, and this is where I'm playing an important role, uh, we're trying to bring a, a treatment recovery stabilization center here to Hudson. Uh, because of my position, but by the way, I go back a little bit, I'm, I'm the minority leader, as well as being a 4th floor supervisor, I'm also the minority leader in the county. And what that means is, doesn't mean I represent the minority population, as well, somebody had told me before. It means that the Democrats are in the minority in the Board of Supervisors right now. And they elected me to be their leader to move forward the agenda that we developed. So all the issues that the Democrats move forward on the Board of Supervisors, I don't develop all the issues. We develop them as a caucus. I'm the one who moved them forward on the floor. I'm the one that is fighting. I'm the conduit between the state and the county, and sometimes between the city. So a lot of times when we have resources of information flowing between the governor's office and here, it's coming through me. Um, so with that being said, I started using some of that influence to the city of Hudson's benefit. Um, and recently, we've tried to bring this stabilization center here. I have been able to get the governor's staff and the executive from OASIS, which the nonprofit organizations around here will tell you has been very difficult for them to do. I've, I were able to get them in all in one room, sitting with us at DSS, talking about real time issues here in Columbia County and also stressing the fact that we want a stabilization center here in Columbia County. And, and we're, we're getting a good reception from them. Right now, they're constantly writing us, sending us emails, calling, saying we are very um, pleased to see that the legislature down here in Columbia County is taking such an active role in fighting opiate addiction in Columbia County. Uh, because in the past, we weren't doing nothing. Uh, at least as far as us being in the trenches. We were giving money, but we weren't doing the fighting ourselves. Now that we're getting involved, uh, the governor's office in Oasis uh, is taking notice to that. Uh, and so we're optimistic. We're highly optimistic that we will have something here um, you know, in the very near future. I would like to say next year, but that's being too, uh, that's being too positive. I, but I, you know, we're hoping. Um, and so, with the opiate addictions, often though, a lot of people don't know what's going on. So I'll give you some real hard facts. In around 2004, 2005, we had four people that od The following year, it was four to six, somewhere in around there. And it kept staying stable in there until it got up until about 2011, 12. Uh, and it went up a, a little tick. And I think in 2014, we had seven. Last year, well, this current year, we've had 11 already. All of last year, they had 11. We're, if we stay at this pace where we're at, we're going to be in the 20s. That's an epidemic, folks. Looking at the population size that we have here, that we have, and this is deaths. This is not OD. This isn't people that we saved with Narcan. These are people that actually OD'd and died. And, and that should be alarming to all of you in this room. Um, it certainly scared me. And, and so what we did, again, as a county, is another thing we did. In response to that, we had a, a young man OD in one of the restaurants over in Warren Street in the bathroom and died. And the people in the restaurant panicked, didn't know who to call or what to do. So that's why it was important for me to help get that call line up. But one of the other things that was important um, I thought it was very important, and we're going to continue to do that, is to do Narcan training. And if people don't know what Narcan is, it's a drug that could essentially put your overdose in reversal. Um, it, it's not 100%, but it is very effective. 
Um, and Project Safe Point through Catholic Charities is the lead on that. And what we did is, I went out and I solicited, I gave out flyers to all the businesses on Warren Street and told them we're going to be given a Narcan training at, that was hosted by Club Helsinki, who paid for, you know, hosting it and they, they made the space available to us, so thank you to them. Um, and funny enough, I had some restaurateurs tell me, we don't get that client, kind of clientele. That kind of clientele doesn't come um, in our restaurants. Folks, listen to me. People, the average age we're seeing is 25 to 45. The demographic, these are middle income to upper income people that are old in. These aren't poor people. It, it has, it does not discriminate. It doesn't run social economic lines. You know, we have people that are OD and that are super rich, doctors and lawyers. We have people who are overdosing who are poor. But for you to think that people who are using your establishment and isn't OD in, you're putting your head in the sand. We have school districts that have told us the same thing until they had an overdose and then they're crying, that now they're screaming for all the services possible. Look, it is in first, pretty much every community within Columbia County, Green County, it is all around us. And, and we know. And so we got frustrated about this. And so uh, one of the next things we did, and, and again, I was spearheading this with the, the commissioner of DSS, is that a lot of these counties, especially in the Midwest and stuff, had decided that they had enough with the doctors prescribing all these opiates uh, and with the, the things they were doing in and around there. So they sued them. And we said, hey, look, that's a, a brilliant idea. Um, who do we sue them? We had no idea. So um, I know we, you know, some people saw in the paper that this company, this lawyer company, was soliciting counties and, and um, looking, actually trying to do class action lawsuits. That isn't the case. We called them. We wanted to know what it was we could do in Columbia County. We didn't want to punish the local doctors because we know that they were trained you know, to feed this poison to a lot of people. And so we're going after the pharmaceuticals and the four doctors that went on, the, on TV, and you see those commercials where they come on and say, if you take this, you'll be healthy. And it'll come with a whole list of things that, that ultimately will harm you. And so we know that that happened with the opiate population, and so we're going to sue them. Um, we're making it clear to those, kind, those companies that that kind of business is not welcome here in Columbia County. You're up here, Chief. Um, that that kind of business is not welcome in Columbia County, and that we're not going to tolerate it anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah. You too, sorry. Um, so, those are some of the things that we are doing in Columbia County. And, and uh, before I have the chief and the sheriff speak, I want to talk about the relationship in Columbia County. And Supervisor Cross can certainly echo this. When I joined the Board of Supervisors, the relationship between the county and the city was probably the worst of any government relationship that you had. It was very difficult. People always come and say, oh, you're a supervisor, you should be able to get this for Hudson or that for Hudson. Well, we're five supervisors dealing with a board of 23, 18 towns. Well, all those towns are fighting for the same resources that we're fighting for. How do you convince someone in Taconic to vote for a program that's going to benefit only the people in the city of Hudson? It's very difficult. And when I joined the board, there was a lot of animosity towards the city of Hudson. In fact, the city of Hudson was hated. One of the first things they did, they tried to put a shelter in the St. Charles Hotel when I joined the board. They were going to turn that into a shelter. Then, then it was, we're going to move Akawama, we're going to move DSS to Akawama, then we're going to move to Walmart, then we're going to cut your sales tax. It, there was open war on the city of Hudson. And I was fighting every day, writing letters, writing plans, along with Brother Cross. It was very difficult. I tell you, the first four years I had there was not pleasant. When Supervisor Bratton came in and became chairman, things changed. The relationships got better. We were able to fight and keep DSS here in Hudson. We were looking at a $5 million renovation. We've been able to do it in-house for around $800,000. We have it here. We're renovating it. And it's now turning into a beautiful building inside if anybody has been inside. We've changed the culture. We are now, we worked on the physical part. We are now working on the mental minds. 
on how they're going to treat clients as they come in the door. Right? Then we start talking about, somebody mentioned about sales tax. Well, let me clarify some of that because they were saying, well, we don't know how the sales tax is distributed. The sales tax is distributed based on population. Hudson's population happened to be about the third or fourth highest in the county. So if we were to distribute the sales tax solely based on that, we wouldn't be getting a third of what we're receiving right now. It was a negotiation that was crafted by Supervisor Sclair, myself, and a couple others negotiating with the other members of the Board of Supervisors, who are the executives, about coming up with a formula that would allow Hudson to get more money simply because the county has a lot of resources here and they drain a lot of our resources to maintain those facilities. And so we said, look, you're going to have to compensate us at a different level. We cannot continue to get um, sales tax based on population. Um, and thus, that's how we get the additional money. Now, can additional monies be had through preemption and things of that nature? Sure they can. We don't know, though. Everybody's been trying to build a calculation on what those numbers would be and what, that, what those funds would be. And I would love to see those numbers myself. I've been asking the Senate, and they keep telling us they can't do it. So if, if Steve Dunn or Tom DiPietro or anybody else can get those numbers and can show that we will get more sales tax if we were to preempt, I'm all for it, right? But no one has been able to extrapolate those numbers to this point. Um, but with that being said, I mean, we have right now the best relationship with the county that I think we could ever dream for. You know, I'm now going to them and asking them for programs. Like when we, the promised neighborhood, everybody, you know, I start, I'm starting to hear that mention more and more because of the great work they do. Well, I was one of the, the initial founders of the Promise Neighborhood. And when the grant was written to submit for the implementation grant, you know who paid for it? Columbia County. When we went to go get, uh, uh, when we did the mentor program, great program was written by SBK. Um, and, and in conjunction with DSS. Well, a lot of, because a lot of politicalness got involved in that, they didn't want to do it. But eventually, you know who paid for it? Columbia County. The reentry program, I was sitting at No Leaders. Two young ladies, I called them young, uh, two young ladies walked up to me and said, hey, we would like to create a reentry program. It's going to save a lot of money in Columbia County and it's going to save lives too. I said, explain it to them. We helped them rewrite that program. That program now is in our jams, working with people, um, prisoners on pre release saving us hundreds of thousands of dollars, keeping people out of our homeless shelters, our homeless housing, we don't call it shelters anymore, excuse me, out of our homeless housing. We're trying to help them get employed before they're released. It is saving us a tremendous amount of money, but it is also saving lives. And who's paying for it? Columbia County. So we, the county has recognized that Hudson was a weak link, and we're only as strong as our weakest link. And so the two, the two previous chairmen we had, the current chairman we have, recognize that, have partnered with a lot of us in Hudson, and is willing to work with us in Hudson. And so I'm really thankful for the relationships I have with the, with the two chairmen. I'm thankful for the relationships I have with the Hudson supervisors. And I certainly am thankful for our, um, all of you who have gotten behind me and, and supported me this far, uh, and hopefully continue to support me in the, in the future. Um, and I'm thankful for the Democratic supervisors from the other towns who support me as being their leader. Uh, because I am able to work hard for the Democrats, but I'm able to work really hard for you guys. Uh, and so to the main issue, one of the main issues, and so how I'm going to handle this, I'm going to break it into two sections. The one section, the first section we're going to talk about is the recent violence that has been going on in the city of Hudson. So we're going to hear from the chief, we're going to hear from the sheriff. Uh, I don't know if the is here, but if he is, we're going to hear, oh, he is here. Right here. And I was able to see. <laughs> so we're going to hear from the DA. Um, and, and then we're going to do some question and answer and let them give you some facts about what happened. And then we're going to talk about DRI and housing. Because I do have news about that too. And I know there's a lot of conversation taking place about that. And I have some pretty exciting news to announce about that as well. Um, so starting off with the violence, I would just like to say, the chief and the mayor is absolutely the lead in this. We are just partners. 
we're, we're assisting where we can. Uh, we are by no means, when I say we, meaning county officials, trying to take a lead on this. Um, our, our police chief in, in the department is doing a job beyond phenomenal. Um, and they're to be congratulated for the work that they're doing to this point. But they need help. And, and I'm sure the chief will talk about that. Um, but as far as my role on the county, you know, I call the chief, I call the mayor, and I call a few other people. And what I did is I started coordinating county services outside of law enforcement. Because law enforcement is going to do the bulk of the work, and these guys are tired. Um, you know, not only are, do we have these couple of incidents happen, but there are other incidents that are happening in and around the county and also the city of Hudson. And so I um, met with the chairman and the sheriff, um, and the chairman has sworn to the, the um, sheriff that the county could commit any and all services that the city needs until they don't need them anymore, regardless of the overtime. Again, going back to that relationship that the city now has with the county, uh, we have a great relationship. Um, but so we're coordinating other services in the county to look at this issue to see what we could do outside of law enforcement. These are not law enforcement agencies. I don't want to mention them by name because people need to become or start afraid about what has happened in our community. Um, but there's a lot of coordination going on. And so with that being said, I'm going to let the chief come in and tell you what he as a lead is doing um, in the city of Hudson to try to keep our, our community safe. Chief. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's important to make a side note here that we uh, buried uh, Chief Holleran today. Um, he was a police officer here from 1952 to 19, I think, 83, 82. So um, the reason I bring that out is he told me before he died that Hudson Police Department had one police car and they had 62 bars in town. <laughs> so they somehow were able to get it done. But I think about those times and uh, how times have changed. Uh, Hudson in those days could operate in a vacuum. Some of the old police chiefs have told me the phone barely rung at the station. Um, they, had maybe a couple hundred calls for services in an entire year. Uh, I just checked before we got here, our department has almost 6,000 calls for service to date, uh, steering towards 10,000 calls for service for the year. It's tough to do with 23 or 24 people. So the difference between Chief Jake's time and mine is so many things. We need 100% help from the county, the state, federal government, everything, all sources, all resources have to be brought to bear to make any progress. There's cell phones now, and there's uh, social media, and main means of communicating in cars, and, and things that uh, the old chief never thought of. So when I call uh, Sheriff Bartlett on a big case, the first thing he says is, how can I help? What do you need? Uh, same with the state police. Uh, I got a call when this last shooting happened. By the way, we've had six shootings since May 1st. So when this last shooting happened, Supervisor Hughes called me, and what can I do? And had some ideas about some of these residents where people are hanging out, and what can the county bring to bear to help me? I don't know that it's unprecedented. I, I, don't, I wasn't here forever. But I would think that it's remarkable these times that we you know, police agencies absolutely need to work together to be, to be effective. So, um, and that goes to the DA's office too, because uh, we have to make good cases uh, with plenty of evidence to get a good conviction to prosecute a case. So, in this last uh, bunch of violence, I've asked the people of Hudson to be patient. We know that the big picture is that crime is improving, okay? But it's hard to convince people when there's bullets whizzing around on State Street, that they're safer than they were before. So um, we're working hard on it. We've brought all these assets to bear, and I fully expect that we will settle this case of the shootings. Um, so I just wanted to make mention that the cooperation level, as the supervisor said, on fiscal matters and these kind of matters are very high. Well, the law enforcement cooperation is higher than it's ever been. 
it seems like uh, the egos of, of years and years ago and, and fighting and turf batting is gone. Uh, I'll accept all the help that I can get from the sheriff, and he offers it. So with that, we can make changes and, and actually do some good things and bring these things to a successful conclusion. And then go forward, as the city has, uh, with their falling crime rate. Now, the message that I've been getting out on these six shootings is that it's targeted violence. Uh, we're, we're not seeing random victims being picked up off the street or mugged or or shot or robbed. What we're finding is that these are two factions with gang influence fighting out uh, amongst each other. And the problem is, in these cases, innocent people, uh, this is where the danger is to the community, in innocent people get injured, can get injured, killed, um, and this is where we have to take quick action and use all our resources. So for the residents of Hudson, we've stepped up the patrol to be more visible, and we've put a lot of investigative resources in place to um, make some arrests and get this thing going. I don't make promises in my position because, you know, nothing's guaranteed, but I'm sure that we will uh, make things better and try to bring this thing to a conclusion. Um, that's all I have to say. I haven't prepared anything, but I, I don't want this question answered well, now. Um, what I want to do, you stay here, Chief. Yeah. I want to bring the sheriff up and also the DA and let them just give you a, a brief summation of what it is they're doing, and then we will open it up for a question and answer from you, the general public. services with the police chief and what the county is doing. Sure. Um, thank you for having me, number one. Like the chief said, interagency cooperation has never been at its best. I've been here 33 years. Long time. And there was fighting, there was turf fighting. Troopers do one thing, and I see laughs out there. Come into the city, what are you doing in the city? They see a, a red and white in the city, why are you here? It's not like that anymore. And we had a perfect storm. Three years, six months, 31 days ago. When I took over sheriff and Chief Moore came in as the chief, we had Captain Scott Brown on the state police Livingston barracks. All that crap went away. We come here and we do a job. This is our community. This is our city. These are our towns. This is where we all live. And all of it went away. Interagency cooperation, information sharing, joint operations, it's all happening. I have state police, I have city police, I have my deputy sheriffs, my investigators working together. Whether it's on the streets, whether it's in our schools, whether it's just down here helping out with a parade, we're here. I've devoted any and all resources to the city. The city's still in my county. This is still part of my jurisdiction. And this is my community. So whatever, uh, the chief's heard it probably a hundred times. Hey Eddie, how you doing? Hey Davey, what's up? Nothing. Whatever you need, you got. I appreciate it. Thanks. And I've gone to the supervisors, and I've gone to supervisors and said, I've gone to chairman, and I've said, there may be overtime, but I really don't care. Because I work for you. These guys have heard this before. I don't work for them. The sheriff of the county works for the people of the county. And right now, we got a problem down here. I went to, I've been at the fair. So I'm kind of tired right now. <laughs> I raced down here, I got a race back. You know, but my wife says, when I went out, I'm the sheriff, I'm in the office, I go see Maria, I come down to the meetings. She said, Dave, you're going back out, you're messing up, right? Hmm. And I'm messing up. You know, who would ever thought that I'd be strapping on my vest unless we were doing a raid? You know, one thing that helps us a lot is having this man here. Because he's a good DA to have in the county. I've been working with this man for most of my career. Whether it was the DA the first time or his county court charge or back as DA. And we are all cooperating. He's devoted assets to our, some of our task forces, our impromptu task forces that we've got. When we, this all started, let's put something together. And we sat down right away and we put a little task force together. State, federal, local, county, district attorney's office. So everybody is sharing, everybody's working. And just be rest assured, I'm here 
for you as your sheriff and here for the city, here for the county. The county board of supervisors, on the flip side now, supervisor, you just wanted me to talk about that. Um, I came to them and I said, I need some more help out on the streets. And I had originally planned for another deputy sheriff, which they gave me to help out with the uh, uh, civil enforcement. I said, um, do I need it? Yeah, but I need it on the narco investigator. They immediately said, the Reverend, Supervisor Hughes, they all sit on my public safety committee. Not one of these gentlemen said, no. Not one of them batted an eyelash when I needed this new investigator. I'm proud to say I've got this investigator out on the streets now. He's very aggressive. And let's face it, these two factions that are fighting, it's all over dope. <laughs> and so we've got these guys out here now trying to work the streets and, and working hard. I want, I'm working right now, and, and we put it in the budget, and Maria, you like maybe to hear this one. Um, we handle most of the DARE programs in the county. You like it, don't you like it? Some people say it's useless, some people say it's great. I think it's great. I still have it. Targets of fifth graders. Hudson PD takes care of the city of Hudson. I went to the supervisor and I want to hit the older kids. Fifth graders are cool. Let's hit the older kids. They have eighth grade, ninth grade programs. So I've gone to them now and I've asked them for another deputy sheriff to rotate through the schools to hit the older kids in the eighth grade, ninth grade area. Before they're getting into high school, now, you know, fifth graders are one thing. Are they seeing it? Yeah, they're seeing it. They're seeing the drugs. But those eighth graders going into the high school at that time, maybe we can catch them again and capture them again. You know, we've had a program now, and Hudson Police have had it for a long time. We've had it when I came in. I started to back up, actually, um, the school resource officer program. And they got Jake over at the, the schools here. I have four deputy sheriffs out in the county. They handle all the schools. The kids love those cops. They truly do. They trust them. They sit down and eat lunch with them. It, it's a great program. And there's another way we're getting into the schools and gaining the respect and, and just being able to sit down and talk to these kids. If I walk in, they're like, you know, who's that guy? Who's the old guy walking? You know, it's like, what are you laughing at? You're just as old as me. So, um, <laughs> but when they see Deputy Toby or they see Deputy Cindy or Deputy Wendy or Deputy Ian coming in, they trust them. So that program, and Jake, sitting down, having lunch, doing bike rodeos with them. So that's working in the schools, too. I'm a big believer in working with our schools nonstop. I have a personal relationship with all the supervisors and superintendents and everything else here. So, um, so uh, with that, our, the DARE program is very important, and that goes back to our whole year program, because we are focusing on prevention, education, treatment, and recovery. So we know that going through with our opiate stuff. Um, with that, too, I want the Mr. DA to tell us what, what you're doing as far as working with these agencies and trying to address the violence that we have going on there. Well, first thing, Mr. Supervisor Hughes, I'd like to thank you and tell you how honored I am that you thought enough to invite me tonight. Thank you very much. I'm honored to have work, work, uh, been working with one of the most dedicated, hardworking public servants I've ever had the pleasure of meeting, working with, and that is Supervisor Hughes. I'd also like to honor Supervisor, who is going, soon going to be a supervisor no longer. I don't know how we can convince you to stay along. <laughs> I think the caucus is already over, but Mr. Supervisor Cross, thank you for your service. You two have been working so extremely hard for all of us for so many years. Thank you. and Ms. Edel for doing, for doing this. You know, you're always behind the camera, so no one ever thinks to thank you, but thank you for doing this and publicizing everything the sheriff, the chief of police, and Supervisor Hughes has to say because it's important that the folks know what's going on. There are only a few of us here tonight, but the message is extremely important that the chief has and the sheriff has and that, most, that Supervisor Hughes has. And this is a crisis that we're in. It's not isolated. It's not limited to Hudson. It's not limited to Columbia County, it is nationwide. And it is something that we've never seen before, ever. Folks, we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of this problem. I know that, I personally know that, because I tried, and it doesn't work. We have to get into the families, into the individuals, into the neighborhoods, and make everyone understand that this crisis, as Supervisor Hughes told us earlier, knows no boundaries in terms of socioeconomic class 
or geography or any place else. It affects all of us, either directly through our friends or neighbors, ourselves. It affects us by the crime rate as it increases. Fortunately, that hasn't been the case in Columbia County, notwithstanding the fact that it's otherwise elsewhere. Because in fact, Columbia County, the crime rate, thanks to the men and women of Sheriff's Office and, and Hudson Police Department, the State Police, has gone down. But that doesn't make us feel better when, as the Chief says, bullets are whizzing by. This is an aberration, and it's an aberration that we're, we are working day and night to fix. And I pledge to you, as the Sheriff and the Chief have, that we won't stop until we can solve this and to make you and your, your neighbors and your family safe. Chief Moore said that he's not familiar with uh, a lot that's going on before him. Well, how many of you know that Chief Moore was born here at Clarence Moore Hospital? Anybody know that? <laughs> not only that, he's a second or third generation Hudsonian, right? <laughs> I was born in Hudson. Um, living in Claremont at the time. But like many of you here, Hudson has changed. To some degree, it's changed for the better. In fact, the new folks that have moved in over the last couple of years are improving the, improving the town, paying taxes, hiring local people. It's also improved because it wasn't that long ago, folks did not walk below 4th Street after 5 o'clock. In fact, folks didn't even come into Hudson after 5 o'clock. So it is drastically improved. I'm hoping with your help that we can improve it still more. Thank you, folks. So uh, with that being said, we heard from all these gentlemen. Just, um, before I open up the questions, there's one point I want to share, I mean the chief to make, because I know it's important that I heard the question asked at one other meeting. Um, Chief, as far as the schools are concerned, when school starts this year, you uh, made a statement about that. So can you repeat that for this audience? And I acknowledge Maria sitting back there. Uh, as soon as this stuff started happening, she was right on the phone emailing me, expressing concerns that parents had. Um, I've also heard it from our residents. Mm -hmm. So at the school year starting September 6th, I've taken the SRO out of the school, put them in a visible marked unit. My patrols, there was a, an order I put out for the patrols to cover uh, the beginning of the school day, the end of the school day, and be highly visible. So the parents, uh, when they're bringing their children in the morning, picking the children up, or they're walking back, they'll see a visible police presence. And we'll keep this up uh, until uh, the, we feel that things uh, are safer and improved. The intelligence we get from this um, case isn't that the school is particularly targeted, or a child within the school is targeted. But still, we want to be a visible deterrent the best we can and try to be very, very present. So I thank Maria for, and uh, we have a great relationship with the school, constantly talking about these issues. So uh, for, the, for the time being, you'll see the extra patrols um, between the three schools. Yes. Uh, so we're going to open this up for questions. I, I just ask that we, we be respectful, you know, no profanity, hopefully all those kinds of things there. But so we will uh, open it up for questions if anyone has any questions. Yeah, I, I want to thank you guys for uh, coming here and speaking. But I also want to know like, what else do you plan on doing in the community? Because the way I see it, there's a big divide between the police force and the actual community. And that's you know, a lot of the reason why you're not getting the intel that you're not getting because there's a disconnect. So, um, you know, going forward, I know you guys have a lot of work to do and you, know, you have a very tough job, which I commend you on. But going forward, what's gonna be done in the community so that your first interaction with a lot of the kids isn't there, which is statistically, you know, doesn't work. I don't want to debate about that. <laughs> but statistically, it doesn't work. But what else is gonna be done in the community for your officers to interact with the community? I can speak for my department real quick. Um, well, where do I begin with that? The SRO program, which we started three years ago, was a good start to introduce uh, police officers, something that I didn't always uh, support, mm -hmm. but felt here in Hudson that was necessary and a good idea. And so far, we got like the perfect officer working up there. Everybody 
every all the feedback I get about Jake Hoffman. So yeah, that is down there. It's a great start. It's a great start. And the other thing is I constantly get, um, okay, what can we do with community uh, community events and things like that? And we do try to participate. I could give you a list of things we participate in, but it's also very hard. When I tell you that um, you know we're doing 6,000 calls to date, it doesn't give a lot of extra time for the things. I, I'd like nothing better than to spend more time. To, I'm out there almost every day, and I love interacting with people. It's really the best part of my job. The worst part of the job is resolving all these 6,000 calls for service. I talked to one of my sergeants today. He has 185 open cases. That needs to be done, too. So it's a matter of trying to use your resources with what you've got. Now, right now, I have 19 officers in me. It doesn't leave a lot of, um, and I've talked to a lot of my officers about it. Uh, they would love to do that. But there's also a job to be done. So it's a matter of finding a balance to improve relations uh, with our residents. And the other thing, too, there's other background things that have to be done. If folks can see that they have a good, honest police force, responsive, that treat them with respect, um, then you start to earn respect, OK? But it takes time. Yeah. So that's. With the people that we've hired over the last few years and this kind of standards we put in, accountability and, and, and transparency that we've tried to do with meetings like this, I think is a little building block towards getting it done. I thought maybe it would be done really fast, but it does take time to build these kind of things. And this is the thing with our shootings. I know that there's people in the community that have information. I know that they know. But when I said before that some of the victims won't talk to us, that's extreme. I mean, that's really extreme. And families of victims won't even tell us, or go see a lawyer. You know. uh, that's an indication of a problem. But it's on both sides, too. You know, I ask people to fairly evaluate the officers they encounter, understand our effort, because the trust is, goes both ways, too. So um, the other thing, too, the other, on a side note, we just hired another officer. We're going to hire another officer on September 8th. Uh, Jennifer Kaiser, Jennifer uh, Link Kaiser. Uh, when we get to full staffing, the order, standing orders I have is for the additional patrols to be on foot or on bicycle, and to get what I promised, you know, three, four years ago, to get them out of the cars and interact more. So as we come up to full staffing, I think that little brick will help build that relationship. So, just in time, just takes a little time. Again. But I understand that I acknowledge what you're saying. May I speak to that uh, supervisor here, sir? Chief Moore spoke about the death of uh, former Chief Holleran. Last night at his wake, the chief and I went through a scrapbook that the uh, that Chief Holleran had, had put together over the years. How many of you folks have been, have been in, were around Hudson in the 1970s and 80s? Anybody? I know you were Supervisor Cross. <laughs> anyway, not many of you. Well, Mr. Hedgepeth, I know you were around. You were, not, not many of us. I can tell you that those of you who were know how things have improved just with respect to that very issue that this man wrote, brought, brought up. And one of the things that is most telling about that was last night, as we were going through this scrapbook, there's a newspaper clipping in which it was noted in a headline that the Hudson Police Department was considering hiring a black police officer. Can you imagine such a headline could even exist in this day and age? Well, that wasn't in the 1919s or 1920s. That was 1986. As recently as 1986. Think about how things have improved since then. That very police officer who, became, who was hired later became chief. In fact, he was Chief Moore's uh, predecessor. But the fact is, things are relative. However unpleasant and, and difficult things or uncomfortable things are within the community, they are infinitely better than they were just a short time ago. And that's thanks to Chief Moore and, the, and the, so many police officers that have uh, worked since then. Thank you, Mr. Uh, to, to the comments of the DA's head, we, we know that we have a diverse police force, and there's still more work to be done on that, and I myself have been doing work, and there's others in the community that are doing work on that. So 
we know that that needs to be done. Another question? Hey, can I jump on real quick from a sheriff's son? Okay. Um, Come on. <laughs> uh, as far as the sheriff's office, what we do to get back into the community, we have our SROs around the schools. We have a, a certain unit that's called a, uh, a resident deputy program. Resident deputy program are deputy sheriffs that actually live and work out of the area where they live in. So they have a better grasp on it. It's almost like a beat cop, but it's the county. I got 600 plus square miles. So that is great because those guys and girls get out to parks. They get out to different community events. We come down to community night out down here. We work the Greater Hudson Promise neighborhood on a regular basis. So that's how we're getting out and doing things on the deputy side of things. Um, on the treatment side, I'm proud to say we're the first agency as far as helping the community. Um, first agency in the county to go full time in Narcan. We were third agency in the state of New York to <coughs> launch the Vivitrol program. So, so hopefully we're stopping the opiate abuse, stopping whatever drugs we can stop when they get out. Because about 85% of my population in the jail is addicted to something. And now we have Twin County signing my facility, so helping out the, the community there, and also an inmate services coordinator, and that's where reentry comes in. Um, so when these guys and girls get out, they aren't homeless, they aren't looking for a job, they aren't worried about where their dog or cat's going to go. DSS has, has done a good job of putting Kate over with us, and she's our inmate services coordinator. And so she's helping out there. So sheriff's-wise, we are on the community a lot. I have that luxury. Yeah, can I just yeah. say one thing as well? Um, I, I do see a lot of officers at these events and at these things, but they're not approachable and they're not personable. So like, if this is something you guys can take back to your stations and let them know, like, it's okay to interact with the community and smile. Because if they're at these things and I worry about this, and I'm glad that you and Maria had a conversation and there's a plan in place, but I don't want to take my daughter to school and there's cops serious on the corners and I feel like I'm dropping her off at prison. So like, you know, I would just say that like, just, you know, give them a hint to be personable, to interact with people. So like, it, it's, it's a comfortable feeling because it says serve and protect. So I'd like to see them, you know, serve and protect. I just want to piggyback off what he's saying. I work at Promise Neighborhood, and Rashonda came to drop off some car keys, and our kids freaked out. Yeah. So that's what he's saying. You know, they these are the same officers that maybe responded to a domestic dispute at their house. So if you're not communicating and, and really interacting with them, they're scared of you. Whether they scout the people or purple purple dots, they scare you. It has nothing to do with the color they skin. That's true. <laughs> That's what they were saying between firefighters and cops, right? Mm -hmm. We're heroes. Not the firefighter too. <laughs> it might, Firefighters are always the heroes. It might not be much that we did take that military uniform away. Yeah. Okay? A couple years ago, which is scary to kids and they see on TV and stuff, you know, with the bulletproof vest on the outside and those pants with the pockets, the GI stuff. We did take that away. And uh, starting in the fall, they put the ties back on like I have on now. I think it might be minor, but I think it's a small thing that helps. I want to go back to something you said um, regarding the different agencies inside of the county getting money for, um, to work on drug addiction and, and solutions, and that you discovered that nobody was talking to each other, or sufficiently. And then there, what I heard you say was that there was work being done. But what I didn't hear, and I just want to, and I appreciate the work that you're doing on that. What I didn't hear, and I think is really important, is the oversight. Like, who's doing the oversight of that now that you've discovered that and getting, getting the different agencies working together? Who's... Yes. Yeah. Okay, but he, he didn't say that, so that's what I wanted to know. Because I wanted to know, like, who's doing the oversight of that and the, the governance of it? So as it, as it stands right now, the current system we have, we're still giving money to all the various agencies, and it's being more closely watched by our controller and also the supervisors. What the, what the future it holds is that person that I, I mentioned earlier that we're looking to hire that is going to coordinate all the services, that person will also be responsible for um, determining and outlining 
say we're sending $20,000 to agency X, they will document that, and we are already asking those agencies now to collect data, because data is going to be an important part of what we're doing, and so we want to be able to articulate why it is we're sending that much money to a particular agency and what they're spending it on, because right now we really can't say that. Um, we can only go on the word that they give us. So we're going to tighten that up, and we're going to do that with that with that coordinator that we hired in the very near future. Great. One more piece about that. Right. Does the, the different agencies, or is there a intention for these agencies, what they're intending to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And then is there going to be, or does there, or does the county then go back and say, OK, yay, you're on track. No, you're not on track. Is that part of the over, is that, is that considering to be part of the so, oversight? I'm not sure that we, the county, are prepared to say that we're on track or off track because we're relying upon the experts in the room. And each one of these agencies, say for example, Twin County, has its own expertise. They, they're focusing in and around treatment and recovery, but that's, they're the experts in that area. Absolutely. I, right. I, I, I wasn't clear. But the county is giving money to the agencies. Mm -hmm. So is there, doesn't sound like there has been, but is there the thought that in the future when you're giving money, mm -hmm. that you're going to tie the money and future money to the, are you doing what you say you're doing? Um, I mean, it's when we when we give out funding to particular agencies, we want a service. We we're paying for a service. We're contracting with these agencies for a service. Now, how specific we give it them and the requirements? I mean, we're absolutely gonna we, and we do. We have contracts MOUs we call them um, with all the agencies that that we contract with now, and certain requirements are built within that now. Um, but. We're going to be looking for, which we haven't been, we're going to be looking for them to extrapolate the data. That's where the problem come in, is some of these agencies may be talking to each other um, uh, on a, a macro level, but what we're not seeing is people sharing data, people talking about that kind of, you know, people start to get um, territorial. I do an educational program, so why are they doing an educational program? And we're trying to, we're trying to eliminate that. We want agencies who are willing to work on this subject to be able to work in the common space together for the greater good of everybody, instead of trying to take a single hold on this and saying, this is just my territory and I'm going to do this. That's our goal. You're trying to say, you know, for a long time now, county monies in terms of Stop, w, Stop DWI, uh, child seat uh, programs, vehicle and traffic enforcement programs, have all been allocated uh, uh, corresponding to performance. So the sheriff's allocation is going to be more than mine because his enforcement is greater. And that's been strictly monitored over the years. And, and my stop DBI money just went up because we increased our enforcement, which is what they want to see. I think what's going on here is something new. You know, we're looking at new types of programs, and I think that that eventually will come around, be allocated according to what you're doing. like the city's budget where it's, you know you kind of go in there and they have a, a line and it just says police. And we actually we actually break our point ones and point fours and if people don't know point ones is what we pay for salaries and we start paying for MOUs and programs. Point four is usually what we're paying for desks and maintenance and things of that nature. So you can go in and see our point ones and our point fours. You can see what nonprofit organizations we have MOUs with. Um, we spend in public dollars. Can't hide spending public dollars, so we don't try to. Yeah, but uh, there's, there's a difference between hiding it and then not broadcasting it. In general, most people aren't going to go look up the company budget and pick it apart. What I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm so are you suggesting that I, 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 I construct a list of all the nonprofit organizations? I mean, I can. I'm I, suggesting that there should be a way that it's more than a friend that you broadcast it. Because I'm not saying you're doing a bad job or right. that you're putting money somewhere, but if you are putting money somewhere like car seats, like, that's something that you might want to look at as some kind of outreach that this is what we're doing, and it's not just a billboard that I drive by every day and I have no idea who. Right, but, but we also, 
also understand. For example, if we're doing a car seat program, and I'm just using that because you use that as an example, a lot of times that's a federal funded pass through. So it's not the specific tax dollar that's coming from federal. It's, it is a tax dollar, but it's not the specific one. Um, or a lot of some of the monies that we're spending with mental health association or twin counties, these are federal pass through dollars. So for us, we have to make the distinction in that, that we're spending federal pass through dollars, but we're spending specific county taxpayers' dollars. Um, and we have to draw that distinction out. And so that's why if you look in our budget, we actually have um, had that spelled out. Uh, we may have, for example, in DSS, triple F funds. Um, those funds are, are mostly Medicaid reimbursed. So we know we're going to pay 25 cents on the dollar. The state's going to pay 25 cents on the dollar, and the federal government's going to pay 50 cents on the dollar. So if we say we're using triple F funds to pay for a particular program, um, you can say 25% of that cost is going to be on the county's taxpayers' back. Okay. I just think we should do a better job of showing people the good work that you are doing. Because um, okay. it's hard to find right now. Well, maybe not going to be hard to find, but it's not something that occurs to normal people walking down the street. Uh, the second thing I had was... You just stop for to do, by the way. The second question I had was, are there, so on the crime, are there any, were, were there any indicators that show that we were heading towards having a turf war, which is what it sounded like? And if there were, or if there are now, what's, what's showing that the additional patrols and what we're doing now is actually working? Because I, I mean, I heard you say a lot of good things, that's probably what I would say in your position, but... Like, okay, so what's I, that show that? Fair enough. What I've been doing is, is avoiding the word gangs in describing this conflict. But that's not entirely true either, because what we see from our investigations and what's been going on for several years now is outside gang, bona fide gang influences. Uh, people that know gang members that might recruit people or get, bring someone up from New York City or Albany or Troy or something to come into our community. The only tactical advantage we have is that we have a small community. Your officers know most everybody and we can identify people that don't, we, we're not familiar with. We've also brought in different other agencies that are specialized in gangs. That's my greatest fear, is that the gangs will get a, a real foothold here in the, our small community, and then bad things happen. So what I'll say, given the current conflict that's going on, it is groups that have known each other. I say groups in kind of a loose term, but yes, the truth is there is outside gang influ influence, and we're monitoring it and doing the best we can as law enforcement. So, sorry, sorry, I, 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 I'll give you one more, but I kind of want to yeah. go around the room so, so we can. I think what, what, I mean, what I mean is, how do I feel different from the last shooting tonight, like when I walk down the street? Is there anything that you get to see that show that there isn't something going to happen? You know, here's, where, here's where a little trespass to come in. I can't divulge everything we did, do, are doing, because I don't think you want to know, really, and we don't want to compromise an investigation. The only thing that we can possibly do is hope that you trust me that we're doing everything we can to keep it safer than it was yesterday. So I will tell you standing here right now that we are doing that and we have things in place and we're doing the best we can. Is that a guarantee? I don't make promises, like I said, but everything that I know in law enforcement is being done. And that's why one of the things I said, and I, I wasn't specific, is that we're doing a coordination of agencies outside of law enforcement within the county as well, but I'm not going to speak specifically to that just because I don't want to put anybody in danger. Um, question for somebody else. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to say seeing those cars around make me feel a lot safer. Okay, I believe that as a 11 years older man in the second watch, uh, I believe with that, that we have to have a friendly relationship between county with the police. Uh, police. We have to come more. But I am I'm acknowledge that, and I am that last couple of years, the law enforcement, SPD, and sheriff doing very excellent job in the, our work. Because I see that 11 years, I see the lot of shooting now, a couple of years. They're not even, now this year again, it started back. 
So I like to I like to say we should come together, all community and law enforcement community that defeated this kind of violence. So that I I acknowledge that the law enforcement will be defeated this violence with community help. That is my question. Great. Any more questions? I want to see if there's any yeah, violence. Mark, Mark Rainbow 444 for the second word. First, say thank you for your service. Awesome. Love the bicycle cops. I saw them recently. That was awesome. Uh, two questions. Firstly, do, is there an anonymous tip line or phone number or number? I haven't seen one. Is there one? We put out on our website, Facebook page, that uh, asking, look, there's that old saying that the police are the people and the people are the police. We can't, I don't know if I made that message clear enough, we cannot operate without the public support, confidence, right? So we put out on the Facebook that all calls to our detectives are going to be kept confidential. Uh, so that, it's not a, a dedicated tip line, uh, but you can call the station. You do not have to give your name, your social security number, date of birth, anything like that. We've cleared that up. So you can call and you can, you can ask to speak to a detective in this case or any cop and say, look, I got some information, and we'll, we'll record it, keep a lead, and, and do something with it. Is it actually possible to get a anonymous tip line? Because that is distinct yeah. from, right. from what you have presently. Eight, 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 two, eight, two, two tips. Sheriff's office has a tip line. Nobody answers it, it's recorded. I was talking to my friend's supervisor one day, he says people are afraid they're gonna track the call back. We, so eight two two, tip, eight, two, two tips, eight four seven seven. And we had one prior to April. And then we give it all over to HPD. Yeah, we had one prior to April 1st, our, our building move. We did have a publicized number. We just haven't re-upped it yet. But I did put out there in social media that if you call in, you know, you can be anonymous. Awesome. Great. Second question in relationship to tonight's discussion, and this is for you, Supervisor. Can you, obviously, what you said, you know, the, the county budget is, is huge, and we're not going to go through it by item. But can you specifically talk about specific uh, money that you know is going to drug education, drug therapy. Um, I mean, can we talk about some of those specifics? Like what programs you have? Is, is more money going to be funneled into that? Uh, because I, I think, and this kind of piggyback, piggybacks on what the DA was saying, I mean, incarceration, what the police are doing on the street, that's, that's the, that's the band-aid. It's not really treating the problem. So, can we talk a little bit about what we're doing to treat the problem? Specifics. So, right, so, so there's no monies that I know of that are going to, to drug therapy. Um, as far as drug education, I don't know the specific amount, but we pay monies into Catholic Charities, who really is the, the one that deals with the educational arm. And this is, this is what the importance of us doing our opiate response plan is, is because we want to identify the, the the categories in which we want to work in. Education. We know Catholic Charities is there. We have another nonprofit organization that's just moving into the community. They're coming into the space. CPR is now ramping up the move into the space. But none of them have made a financial ask to us yet. So once they do, we will then put that through our subcommittee and then send that up to home committee and we will go through the, the basic financial um, steps that we need to take um, to see if it's a good program or not. That's as far as education. When it comes to recovery and treatment, we give probably somewhere in around $50,000 a year or more to Twin Counties. One is to fund out the um, position of counselor, which they have in the jail, um, and also to fund some of the other services in which they have in and around Columbia County. Uh, we give substantially more, and I don't know the specific amount, to um, Healthcare Consortium, and Healthcare Consortium does a whole myriad of things within um, within the, the whole drug addiction uh, uh, arena, uh, and they too are, are pretty prominent. I, myself, I always thought they, they gave rise to old people to doctor's appointments, but I found out that they actually play an important role in our treatment and recovery in, in and around Columbia County. They're a strong partner with Mental Health Association, Mental Health because people always confuse these. There's Mental Health Association and Mental Health, the County Mental Health Office. Um, and they're also a strong partner with Twin Counties and Catholic Charities. So they play, they play like the intermediary between all the various agencies. 
So when I say we give money to all these different agencies, it's small amounts to all the nonprofits. And I know you're trying to get back to the point where you say you want to see a list of. Um, no, I don't want to see a list. I just think it's important to like, if we're acknowledging that we have the criminal justice system, which is too late then I think it's important that we shape the discussion in terms of our community, what we can do pre. You know, I think about you know, what, what Nick does with the schools and with the Sloop Club. Activities like this, skills, job training, skills, things where we can get them really bridge the gap much earlier on. You know, I think so, about the so kids on my street, I think about Marcel, I think about all the kids that live on my street that need activities and need stuff to do. So, so let me stop so right there. there. First, first of all, our, yeah. our, our opiate program that we're developing, we're focused on education, treatment, recovery, and, and um, you have to the other one I said. But when we're, when we're doing that, we are creating working groups. And I've mentioned this to all the people before in every meeting I speak at. We're creating working groups. And at those working groups, we want people to come there and articulate these kinds of things that you're saying. Now, I'm not saying that they're all going to be adopted, because it's not just me. I'm one vote. But when they come there, we will vet each idea. As the idea comes out of the working groups, those, the ideas will come out of the working group, go to the subcommittee, then go to the full committee. So they will be fully vetted all the way up. And if it probably makes it to the Human Services Committee, there's a good chance that it would be funded. But it's going to have to go through that process of vetting before someone determines that it is a viable program. That's not going to come from me. Nor you. And it's probably like a two to three year it's process. Not be, that that process would be great. We, we were able to get that whole line up and running in six months. Um, and that's from conception to funding. And Mr. Supervisor, with respect to your question, sir, by the time people get to see us, see Sheriff Bartlett, see Chief Moore, and me, if they are nonviolent, non selling addicts, who have been caught up in the criminal justice system, we do have a means by which we can help them. And that is a drug court that is run by Judge Nichols in, in Columbia County. And the uh, drug court, the regional drug court that ja uh, uh, Judge John Connor has be begun uh, some time ago here in the city of Hudson. I can't stress to you how dedicated and how hard those two judges work and all the people that work with them. Beth Schuster in Twin Counties, for example, and so many other persons for most every affected agency in the county. Uh, it is largely funded by the state because of the fact that the state pays Judge Nichols and Judge Connor, but it's also largely funded by uh, uh, the county through uh, a great number. Is that number. and older or the juvenile as well? 16 and older. 16 and older, yes. Okay. And, but, although Judge Nichols, because he is what's called a four-hatter judge, he's a judge of supreme a full-time acting Supreme Court judge. He is a family court judge, a county court judge, and a surrogate. As a family court judge, he deals with persons who commit offenses which, if committed as adults, would constitute criminal conduct. And those are persons now, that are now under 16, as of next year will be under 17, and then under, under uh, 18 and 19. But, so they do have a drug court and family court for juvenile delinquents and persons in need of supervision. And they work extremely uh, hard and they are extremely dedicated and it works. Uh, it's certainly not 100% effective, but, it, uh, but it, is, it is very effective given the, given the uh, fact that this is such a difficult uh, 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 work to do. People who want to recover oftentimes go through many, many, many uh, rehabilitations before it catches. And Judge Connor and Judge Nichols helps them extremely to that degree. So uh, with that being said, I, I, know, I knew this was going to be a lengthy uh, question and answer session, and I wanted people to get all their questions answered. But I, I, I definitely want to get into the housing talks, and then we can come back to answering questions. Um, so Chief, you guys, it, you two are free to leave, Chief, if you can stay for a few more minutes. Uh, but I want to talk about um, the housing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk about the housing um, and what we're doing um, and in, in and around Columbia County in conjunction with the city's DRI. Okay, so the city uh, uh, applied.
high four and one what I see to be this really good uh, prize that was given to them by the state. Um, and I think it, in the long run, will be a real benefit to the economy of the city of Hudson. Now, with that being said, that's where all the consternation comes from and all the worry comes from as people think that it's going to create this economy in the city of Hudson and attract people here that are going to want to be here, that are higher wage earners, and continue to gentrify the communities that we are seeing to be gentrified right now. Um, and my brother, did, um, Kamal, did a meeting uh, uh, about a week ago to talk about that very thing. Um, I had some, some information then that uh, I didn't want to bring out yet because I wasn't able to confirm it. Uh, but since then, I have had conversations. And so what I would like to say is with the DRI, um, about, I would say, six months ago, um, Supervisor Cross, myself, and that through DSS, through DSS, we contracted uh, a, a consultant firm at the county to do a home analysis or housing study, as you will, in the city, in and around the city of Hudson and Columbia County as a whole. Um, and what they did is they did primarily Hudson, did a whole comparison of Hudson to the county to the nation. Um, it's about a 155-page document. It's pretty in-depth. Uh, and one of the reasons why I went that way is I was constantly going to the council meetings. And when I was on the council, we proposed two or three uh, housing projects that, that didn't go through. One, because they said we didn't have the data behind, behind it and the need for it. And there was just a lot of arguments that was going back and forth. Um, and then when I became supervisor, I was watching as proposals would come up in council, and you know I get no vote on the council, so I'm sitting there in the audience and listening to these discussions, being frust more frustrated every day, like a lot of you in this room, that we just couldn't put something together and be able to create affordable housing here. So, um, looking at the numbers every day at DSS, um, looking at the homeless population. Um, and if people think we don't have homeless here in Columbia County, our numbers trend month to month in and around for single individuals. We average about 59 per month, but in the winter months it gets as high as 100. We're, we're somewhere around 95, 98 in the winter months. And we used to be in around four to five families, we're up into around 14 families now. Um, and we know there's more, because if you look at the homeless numbers that the school district does, they count uh, couch surfing and people of that nature as homeless and their numbers were as up as high as 200. So we know that there's plenty of homeless in and around Hudson and Columbia County. So each time, and nobody gets more frustrated than Brother Cross, so each time we would hear the conversations, we would get frustrated. So I said, look, there has to be something we can do. So we contracted this firm, KCG, uh, to do this study and they completed it and the study is pretty in-depth in knowledge. Uh, right now, we just got the report in the hands of the all city supervisors, uh, the mayor, Hudson, and a couple of other officials. We have some typos in there that need to be corrected. The data uh, we see is sound, but there's some things we want to make sure is corrected before we get into uh, public dissemination. But the importance of that plan is, what we found out um, just recently from Albany is, Governor set aside a lot of money, and most people know that. Going through D DHCR, which is Department of Housing, Community Renewal, and also um, federal funds, um, and in an amount somewhere around $2 billion. What we didn't know is when that money was going to be dispersed and how could we access it. What we're now starting to find out, right, that the governor actually has uh, committees up in Albany that are looking at that very thing right now. And one of the things that we are early, being told early hasn't been committed to, but what we are being told is DRI winners, if they're able to put together um, good site plans with hard information, um, they have a good chance to access some of this money. Well, luck, it, luck well, you say luck will have it. We finished the county plan, which really breaks down the need for 
affordable housing. When I say affordable housing, everybody get mixed up with that term, so I, I don't want to confuse anyone. There's, there's a whole bunch of different categories of affordable housing, and that's broken down in, in this study as well. When we start talking about AMI, the area media of income, well, you will see that the area media income for the city of Hudson, specifically the second and fourth wards, is dramatically lower than the county and the nation. Um, and so when we start looking for housing, you want to make sure that we create housing that those populations can afford, which would be, say, 50% of AMI versus 100% of AMI. Um, and, that, and that's being a little technical, but this study gets into all that. But the important part I want to bring out here is what it does is, I kept saying this all the time, we want to run parallel tracks. We wanted to focus on the DRI, Revitalize, um, revitalize our waterfront. We want to do some of the, the great things that people talked about down there in our waterfront because it's going to create an economy that could benefit all of us. It will beautify our waterfront that could benefit all of us. But in the same token, with all of us talking about affordable housing, we need to operate in a parallel track, make sure that we have housing running on the same track. Well, I met with Sheena Salvino today, commissioner of DSS, and the consultant that actually did the county's plan. And we're planning exactly that. We're planning to actually do a housing committee that will develop recommendations that will run parallel to the committee that is making recommendations for the DRI. And we're going to use the leverage of the DRI and some of our political capital that we have um, to, to actually apply for some of those $2 billion to create affordable workforce and low-income housing in and around the city of Hudson. And um, some of you guys who are actually running for office, I'm committed to it. Some of you guys who are running for office, this is going to come across your desk relatively soon. And hopefully when it does, I mean, you stick to your commitment of saying that you want affordable housing. Uh, we're going to put the time and work into uh, coming up with some great plans. I've been talking to people in the community at home that this might be something that we're looking to do. Well, I'm telling you now, it's something that we're not looking to do, that we're going to do. It's just a matter of who's going to be sitting on the DRI committee and who we will have sitting on our housing committee. But we are committed to doing those two things. Um, I'm pretty excited about it because I'm pretty sure with the relationships that we have in Albany um, and with us winning the DRI and with the, the way that people look upon the city of Hudson, including the governor, people don't know that he, that he looked at, at Hudson, um, he really likes the location, he and the lieutenant governor. They like, they sneak into Hudson and stay at the hotels every now and then. Most people don't know that, but I do. Um, so they frequent here, so they see what we have here. Just like we see it, they see it. You know, a lot of outside people see it, and we have a great opportunity. We have an opportunity to do with what Kamal has some of the people articulate in his meeting that we can make this city for all. People that who have been living here for generations don't have to be pushed out. They can take part in, in joining into music and art programs and they can enjoy the waterfront and their kids can grow up here and thrive just like everybody else. That is the dream. That is, that is one of the main reasons why I stand up here uh, hoping to be your supervisor again is because those are the kinds of work, that's the type of work I'm passionate about. I love doing that. That's where my passion lies. Um, but with that being said, I'm sure there's a lot of questions in around this, so if you guys have questions, fire away, um, and I can answer, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Yeah. Mr. Hughes, you're doing a great job, and thank you. And I just want to talk, mention the word gentrification, because I left Brooklyn, and I saw what happened in Brooklyn. And when gentrification starts, it's a force that no one can really stop. So everything you're doing is great, but all the same, um, when development starts to happen, there's a threat. And the latest rumor that I heard was that every landlord in Hudson now is going to try to rent for the same rates they're charging at the falls. That's typically what starts to happen when you get an area that's gentrified. Now the falls, Believe it or not, I know someone that lives there. The apartments are very reasonable for what's being offered. It's just that everyone can't afford it. So, okay, 
but the crummy apartments that will be rented for those rates are not worth it. And that's, that's um, a greediness that takes over. And for those of us who own our own homes, when stores on Warren Street, like no leaders, if they can't be there because they can't afford the rent, then all of us suffer. And I think um, it's something we have to start looking at. I think there are two groups in Hudson that are already focused on gentrification, and maybe you can have town halls like this one in the future to look at that subject. Uh, so you also provided, and I was saying, Look, there's a lot of us, I've been contacted by a lot of people, there's a lot of people interested in exactly what you're saying. They, they know that they're being squeezed out. Even some of the people who have moved here themselves are now being squeezed out because of the rent prices. And I've been saying this for a long time and it's now slapping us in the face. But I think we have some really intelligent people um, who have moved here in Hudson. We have some intelligent people like my brother Uncle Kamal right there who are interested in this issue. And I think if we can get more people who are interested in this issue, and let's do something instead of talk about it, um, you know, that, that right there will, will be a big help. And I think by us winning this DRI, actually it's gonna be a catalyst for us to get monies for a developer. Our goal moving forward is finding a site that's developable and, and actually having a development firm come in and say, yes, we will do it. Now, how quickly we can ramp up to that? Look, for me, the dream is December because that's when the next round of funding is. I'm not promising that we could do it in December, which will, if we start building then, uh, we'll probably be 14 months out. Uh, but if we can get something identified and up and ready by December, wonderful. Uh, but I think we're gonna do something. Again, that, that's, you know, for 
a city, a city official, they're going to have to um, articulate, uh, we're going to have to look to our, our council uh, on these particular issues of uh, whether we're trying to protect citizens' rights who are already here or already living in the existing dwellings or already like a particular situ uh, area. Uh, I, I can say right now there's no guarantees, but we have people like yourself and other people that will hopefully some of the candidates that we have that are running for office are hearing some of these comments. Uh, maybe they, they'd be willing to say that they're willing to guarantee these. I saw you get ready to raise your hand, Tommy, you have a comment on that? I didn't raise my hand, but as you know, last night I said uh, one of the uh, key aspects of preventing further gentrification is protecting rights. And whether the tenants are drinking for them now is up in the air, but uh, one way you do that is, of course, a rental, a rented registry for people who feel that they're in the, uh, that their rental situation is threatened and that they know the city, in this case the housing committee, which I've talked about at the starting, would um, help them in terms of either negotiating with their landlord, trying to get them whatever kind of voucher system that could come into play, or to relocate them within the city, so they didn't have to leave the city. But more importantly, as Billy said, in terms of developing new housing, not only are we talking about provisions that the state would impose if we got state money, but also community land trust. Because the way land trust system works is, you know, your rent might go up, um, but you're paying into your own equity that you own. And that's a, uh, that's a model that we're exploring and I hope to see happen. And how does that people know where to address that registry? Uh, no, because I'm not in office yet. What's <laughs> 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 gonna happen? You're going to have it all. So. <laughs> there's no at this point in time today. Right. Hey, Jim, I've got a question. Right. You don't mind. Um, I didn't hear, I was in the house um, about possible building new homes or complex, whatever the case may be. And I know the county might be doing it. I didn't hear if it was going to be outside of Hudson or in Hudson. Um, if you are going to build in Hudson, I mean, where will you build in the area of Hudson? Because it's like a lot of things is pretty much secure and taken. Or will you like create more land or there? So, so <laughs> let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, I don't know. I, I, I just wanted to know. Right, That'd be me, great. Let me clear. Right, the county isn't building anything. Other, other than we may, we may concentrate our facilities in the county city campus. Uh, we're, we're not going to build anything. What we're doing is. We're trying, to, we're trying to help the city of Hudson and other communities within the county. And I can tell you, we're looking at Belmont, Malaysia, some of the communities that have some of the same kind of blight that we had, and they're starting to see some of the same kind of gentrification we're seeing, albeit not at the same scale. But we're looking at them as well. But the county study really does a lot of drilling down on Hudson because, again, the county and everybody in and around Columbia County realizes that Hudson is the hub, is the hot spot right now. And look, it, gentrification, has gentrification has happened really fast in this community. And now that the train is moving, it's starting to move at hyperspeed. And so we need to react here much quicker than we would in some of the outlying areas. So the county's job, and we're committed to this, and we, we mentioned that to Sheena, the county's job is going to be to help the city get to the point to where we are actually identifying this site as soon as possible identifying a development company as soon as possible and having them put forward a plan that everybody in this room and everybody else can agree to so we'll, we can start construction. The faster the better. Billy, yes, to add to that, I think, you know, I'm thrilled to hear that and I, I spoke to Sheena about that myself today. Uh, my name is Rick Rector, by the way. Um, and uh, hopefully. Uh, and, and part of the, one of the things about the DRI that I have, that I've stressed, and I hope everyone understands, it's not about tourism. It's it, some of that's part of it, but a big part of it is really developing some infrastructure in a, in a and as I've said it, uh, in a neglected neighborhood that needs infrastructure. And by creating that infrastructure, that will encourage an investor like you're talking about to come in and hopefully start to, to negotiate with the city of Hudson about affordable housing. And uh, you know, and some of that will require the city to have a heavy conversation with pilot programs uh, and what the city is willing to give up in taxes. But there's a whole variety of ways that we can start addressing a lot of these big issues. 
We're also having conversations about zoning in, in certain, and in, in, you know, maybe not rezoning the entire town because that will take years, but possibly layering so certain communities we can, we can consider. We go up four stories now instead of just the two or three and add additional housing. That, and very importantly, getting a lot of this housing stock that's currently sitting there unoccupied back on the market. And that's what I look, you know, I look forward to having this conversation with the community, with the developers, with the business, the owners of the property to make this happen. Well, I, I would say, you, Mayor, um, I, hopefully I'm, I'm able to be in my position and sit with you, and especially being a conduit from the state and we can sit down and, and have these kinds of conversations. One of, the, one of the things that I do want to mention today that was, a, a, for me, a big care was the fact that with that $2 billion that's set aside, um, communities who have won the DRI now are ac actually able to leverage that money with developers with the right plan without the pilot, without using local taxpayers' dollars. And to me, that, that is, is a real enticing proposal to a, a good developer. But that's going to take hard I mean, that may require us having a housing committee instead of meeting every two weeks or once a month. We may have to meet two, three times a week. Now, I'm willing to do that. I do that already with the opiate program. But make no mistake about it, whoever gets involved with this work, it's going to be working. And you're not going to be paid for it. So don't think you're going to be making all this kind of money. It's going to be, you know, you're, you're out there working for the social community. You're working for the benefit of your fellow um, citizens in Hudson. I'm, I'm already committed. I know so a lot of you in this room are committed. But it's going to be hard work, so make no mistake about that. And that $2 billion you're mentioning, is that an allocation to HCR? And is there information on the state's website about how it's going to be uh, doled out? Uh, so it is not for HCR, but the, the guy, actually the guy that you guys have worked with, uh, his name escapes me right now, um, has uh, a big influence because his boss has a big influence over that money. And I think it's H. F-A is the acronym. I, I, I apologize because I don't know what that necessarily means. Um, but that's where the money is going to be placed. But I do know that the previous DH, I mean the DRI winners, are actually preparing themselves to leverage to use that money through the next round that's coming up in December. I'm not sure we're going to be ready. I'm hoping we, I, I would love for us to be ready by December. I, I don't think we're going to be. On a county level, uh, what's the emphasis? Is it on affordable housing or low income affordable housing? So, because there's there's a big difference. There is a big difference. So, for the county, uh, our initial <laughs> emphasis was on uh, low income and homeless housing because we see the numbers. And for people that don't know, I mean, we were spending 2.4, 2.5 million dollars. Um, in our homeless numbers, just between housing somebody with no services whatsoever other than transportation in a, in a meal voucher. There's no place to cook a hot meal. Um, often, we would pick you up with a cab, take you to destination B, drop you off, and come back and pick you up eight hours later and take you back. That's essentially what the county was providing for, for our homeless. We're now um, what, I, what I can say about that right now is we're in the RFP stage of our homeless housing. So we are actually drafting RFP for a proposal, a, a proposed project that we have locked our sights on. Uh, we hope to be able to announce more in November. Um, what I will say is we're looking at a full laundry service. We're looking at a kitchen so that you can make hot meals. We're looking at having uh, a, a picnic area so it seems like more of a family environment and we're going to do it for less money, substantially less than what we're paying now. And so the money that we're saving in talking with potential developers, the money that we're saving, uh, the county can't put that money in their pocket. We're taking that money and putting it into services. So we're going to have 24-hour security service and 24-hour wraparound counseling services. And then we're going to start talking about job training. So when we start looking at our homeless population, uh, we're going to have a real bus service uh, focusing on our homeless population because the goal is to have those people come in, 
get the skills that they need to develop, develop their skills so that we can move them to into affordable housing. Well, my thing is, for them to move into affordable housing, they have to be able to afford affordable housing, and there has to be an existence of affordable housing. Because right now we have a ton of low-income housing. Um, the pro we have a ton of projects, but the problem is, is that the people, they can't move out of them because there's nowhere to go. And they can't do better than for themselves because once they meet that threshold, and then they're pushed out. And I'll use myself as an example where I was living in the Hudson Terrace apartments uh, a few years ago. And I actually got a promotion at my job that put me, I want to say, $1,600 over the threshold. Now, I'm at the point where now it's like I have to move out or I have to not accept that promotion because for me to move into another apartment means that I'm going to pay, you know, three, four hundred dollars more. And if you know when you get a promotion, that's not really three hundred more dollars more in your check that you can pay every week. So right. now a lot of people are saying, you know, okay, I'm not gonna you know, take this extra job or I'm not going to do that and they stay there so they can afford to live. So kind of, you know, getting a promotion or getting a better job actually becomes a negative in the community. Well, so what, what you're in, what, what Hudson Terrace is, is a, is a um, rent stabilization type home, mm -hmm. whereas your, your rent is based on the income that you make. When you start looking at, say, for example, a Crosswinds, a Crosswinds project is a workforce affordable housing and they have uh, entry to uh, they have an entry barrier and an exit barrier. So if you fit within those numbers, your rent isn't going isn't fluctuating based on what your income is. Your rent is your rent. Yeah. Um, so and the waitlist for these programs well, is so, two to three years long. Well, but that's that's where it comes in. Where the city actually, because the city is the one that's going to take on the positive. The developer is going to be here. We're just going to be a, a facilitator, um, in essence. We're going to try to help them find a site and help them find a developer, and we're willing to put county resources in to do that. But the city, with that committee, is going to have to determine what kind of housing. I can tell you, in, in our study, what we found, um, without giving you guys too much of it, what we found is that there is a big gap. We, we're seeing where there's, there's, we're not saying enough supply, but the majority of our supply of, of rentable units is singles. We're seeing a gap where in our um, senior housing, um, there's far, I mean, we just don't have enough, right? That is, that is affordable. And also um, our multifamilies. Our multifamily, somebody brought it up at, at, at your meeting, our multifamily housing is, is falling by the wayside very quickly. And I, you can see that in our homeless numbers in the county. We went from four to seven to now up to 14 families and that's only the ones that have identified themselves. The ones that haven't identified themselves, we're probably somewhere up in around 25. And that's a lot of families that have to house in one community. Someone 
who's that mid-level professional, and as they keep getting raises, they can't get ahead because their rent gets raised to just um, a quarter. Or are we going to develop that housing where it's, it's going to be uh, um, based on your rent, the voucher-based system? You know, all of these kinds of conversations are going to have to be had so that when, and maybe we need a combination, you know, a little of this and a little of that. But you're certainly not going to get that from any one study. The, the community has to be, because, because as our future mayor said, the community has to buy into that because the city may have to contribute to, for, to a developer to come in to do that. Uh, but we know what the numbers are in our study. We now have the numbers. It's just that somebody taking those numbers and saying we're willing to offer an apartment, we can get a developer in here and de on develop an apartment, offer a rent at this much, and the city is going to contribute this much, and this is what your rent is going to be. Somebody brought her to the home where she lives in. The landlord just gave her an extra month to try to find something, but nothing is in her actual budget where she can afford. And then she has Section 8, and there's no landlords that are accepting Section 8. So, so this is so so well, your specific problem, or her specific problem, is exactly what we're trying to address at DSS is that we have people who are receiving Section 8 vouchers and they can't find apartments, A, because either the landlord won't accept them, or B, the voucher doesn't cover the amount of the rent. And so what, we try, what we're doing again, that's what we're going back to is, the, the people who are gonna be your elected officials in the city are gonna have to decide. Are we gonna, are we gonna ask a developer to come in here and develop housing that's gonna be at 60% of the uh, area medium income? And if, it, and if that's the case, then is the city gonna give them a pilot so that they can bring the rent down to that low and then they can accept that voucher. Or if the city isn't going to give them a pilot, they have to seek, seek out state tax credits, um, the rent may actually be a little higher because what happens is a developer comes in, and, and many people know, they're trying to make money. So, you know, they're, they're doing affordable housing and people keep saying they're not getting rich. But nobody's doing a business to, to go broke, right? And so when, when they're coming in, um, they're, they're, they're looking to see what kind of incentives they're going to be offered to bring a rent to a certain level. Those discussions are going to have to take place at your executive level in the city. And you got two of those gen potential gentlemen sitting, or one sitting, sitting there. Excuse me, because I know the consider potential and interesting and potential is good, and that are currently renting. I mean, that would be a great thing. I, I won't have a vote on that, but I think that, that's a really good idea. Um, so, I just say that what you're bringing up is really critical. Yeah. But you're asking this guy who's well, a super... I know it's not him. I right, know. so then that, the, yes, I'm just suggesting that that's a really, really important question that maybe ask, let's ask for a town hall to have the right people in the room having the right conversation. But to have this conversation here without having the right people in it really doesn't. No, but some of the right people even are here. And even though all of us are not elected officials, you all know that by being present here, each of you already have a vested interest. 
So each of you all will know other people who could then make use of their power in the present. So to say to Billy, even though I know that's not your position right now, you also have that influence that all of us do to import our power. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I think point. Thank you. Yeah. I will tell you, and it's been here all night, and I'm going, I will do my best to make sure everybody wants to make a mistake. Me as well. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about. Community has power, yes, right here. So give me a lesson, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bill, I just have one more comment for you and the chief um, on the only issue. What is doing being done by the county and the city and police force to spread the word of the um, Good Samaritan law? Because we had some incidents of overdoses. This is a record number year of overdoses. And I think that um, I did hear the sheriff who left speak about it a few times, but I haven't really seen anyone talk about the importance of the Good Samaritan law. You're right, and that, that's uh, very important because that came up at our Narcan training and people being scared to call about overdoses. So we actually uh, have been talking about CPR and we've been putting it up, but every time we go to a meeting we mention, but we're along with, and I failed to mention this, along with one of the things we're doing is, is um, trying to decide on whether we're gonna build a county website that is gonna be an informational hub, or we're gonna contract with someone, i.e. maybe CPR, who already has an existing uh, website that's pretty robust, and contract with them, and, and we'll put all our county information on that. Um, but you're right, that's an important part, the, the Good Samaritan law, that people know that, that you know, if you happen to see someone who's overdosing and, and you call, you don't have to worry about the police you know, checking you and, or inspecting you to make sure you have drugs or, or that you were getting in any kind of trouble. So thank you for bringing that up. Might be a new, when we uh, migrate over to our new website, uh, might be a good, that and a tips line, which I learned tonight, we'll update our tips line, but that might be a good thing to put on there. Also of the uh, overdoses we've had in the city of Hudson this year, we've made no contaminant arrests <coughs> pursuant to someone reporting a, an overdose. Okay, anything from anybody else? Well, we, well, thank you all for coming out. I